God is not nature. God is not nature. Nature is floods and famines and earthquakes and viruses and little blue-footed booby babies getting their brains pecked out by their stronger sibling. God, I mean, the, the God that I know, the God of love and compassion, that isn't exactly found in nature. I went back to the boat and clouds formed overhead and I decided I would just lay in the fetal position for a while and consider nature. So God and nature are separate. Oh, it is so obvious that that is true. I mean, God is a moral force and nature is utterly amoral. I mean, nature doesn't care about me or anybody in particular. Nature can be terrifying. Gosh, why do they even put words like natural on products like shampoo? Like, that's automatically a good thing. I mean, sulfuric acid is natural. <laughs> I could almost hear God saying, duh. But then God, who are you? Because I can't stop thinking lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear because you are with me. God is love. I mean, can it be that simple for me? You hear it all the time, God is love. God is love. God is a force of love. God is a force of love in the universe. When I was in high school at the Catholic girls' school, Mary Cliff, there was this lay teacher who taught P.E. named Ms. Roberts, and she was gorgeous. She walked like an athlete, her head held high. She was tall and blonde and muscular, a goddess in our midst. I was listening to an interview with Julia Sweeney yesterday, and I heard her talking about her daughter. You, you, you adopted a daughter who's now... Four years old, five years old. Oh, she's six. Six years old. Okay, thank you. And um, when you were that age, I'm sure that there were a lot of like Catholic rituals in your life. And when you asked your parents about things pertaining to life and death, they could give you answers about God and Jesus and, and so on. And those are answers you cannot give your daughter right now. And there are certain rituals that you probably can't provide for her either. So, is that is that a bit of a crisis for you? And are you finding things? Are you finding things to uh, take their place? We live in Los Angeles, and we are not part of a religious community. I mean, we belong to this tennis club that's sort of like a big YMCA in our neighborhood, and we see people there, but there aren't rituals. I mean, it's not as good. I mean, I have to say, it's a loss for her. I wish I could give her the upbringing that I had with the parishes and the neighborhoods. I mean, to me, that was fantastic. And... I wish we could go to church on Sundays. Like, I don't know if I've just been so deeply moved by the Catholic experience that they just don't seem to live up to my, you know, like, I don't, I don't know why I don't keep it up. Like, I just, we just don't have that. And she doesn't have that. And I think, um, you know, I have this vague fantasy that I'm going to move back to Spokane when she's like in third or fourth grade. And then, you know, I can't say that I wouldn't necessarily put her back in a Catholic school where I went to school at St. Augustine's in Spokane. Like, to me, it is a loss. I just don't, I haven't figured out exactly what the replacement is for her. It's funny. Religious people say that the rituals and ceremonies can confuse things. They are just window dressing. But if you remove all the rituals and ceremonies, you are left with just God, just pure meaning. Non-religious people sometimes recognize the darker meaning of these religions recognize that they do not believe, but insist that we all need the rituals and the ceremonies, and gosh, wouldn't things be great if we had that? But that's not what I was going to talk about. I'll let you in on what my problem was after the program. <laughs>
had all of us girls in the gym and we were sitting on the floor listening to a guest musician who I think may have been a friend of Ms. Roberts and he was playing his guitar and singing and at the end of his set he began singing the song Vatican Rag which is very irreverent and has lyrics like bow your head with great respect and then genuflect 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 well the nuns reeled. Sister Mary Howard stood up in the middle of his song and asked him to leave he stopped took his guitar and left then I remember just sitting there in the gym for a while, just sort of decompressing, you know, just talking about God, when all of a sudden, Sister Mary Howard turned to this Ms. Roberts and said, do you even believe in God? Ms. Roberts stared right into the eyes of Sister Mary Howard, and Sister Mary Howard stared right into the eyes of Ms. Roberts, who after an eternity said, I believe in a force of love in the universe. <laughs> All of us girls nodded in agreement. Sounds good to us. Who could argue with that? Force love in the universe? Sure. And then we all looked back at Sister Mary Howard, whose eyes narrowed. Like, that is the wrong answer. <laughs> Only two years later, the attitude of my church towards God being simply love had completely changed. Gonzaga Prep, the Catholic boys' school, had gone co-ed, and that's where I spent my last two years of high school. Everything seemed to be changing. Folk masses were slipping into the mainstream. Some of the priests were using chalices made of thick, handmade pottery, and their vestments were made out of unbleached fabrics, coarsely woven. And instead of the pre-made communion wafers, we all just started breaking a loaf of bread into little pieces, like Jesus did. In the spring, Father Fitterer started teaching us all transcendental meditation. Suddenly, there were guitars in mass and a drum set right up on the altar. Transubstantiation was never like this before. <laughs> Chaplain of Bourbon Street. That's a wonderful, wonderful title, but even more intriguing than the title is the place where I work. How many have ever heard of Bourbon Street? You raise your hand up in the air? Oh, bless your heart. A few of you will admit it, won't you, huh? <laughs> How many have ever been to Bourbon Street? Would you tell that too? Well, bless your heart. Bourbon Street's a pretty good spot for a preacher to be located. But can you imagine a preacher, a Baptist preacher, a Southern Baptist preacher, can you imagine a man opening up a shop right in the middle of hell? Well, I have my office right between the Blue Angel Saloon, across the street from the Hasitas and the Show Bar. In fact, I, I never run out of prospects. Man, I've got them coming day or night, 24 hours a day. 
You know, but the word spread on the French Quarter down there now. Used to, used to the girls. In fact, when I first opened up, one of the club owners sent a girl down to see me to find it, trying to check out, see if I was really real. And they sent a pretty one down there. And I, I, tell, I tell you, she was a dandy. And uh, that particular day she came in, she says, oh, oh, you sure are big and strong and stout and everything, preacher. Well, I knew right offhand she had good taste, you know, and I was, I was kind of going along with her. And, and, and she said, she said, don't you think I'm pretty? I said, yeah, I think you're pretty confused. And if you, you don't get right. She said, how about my hair? Don't you think it's lovely? I said, yeah, it's beautiful. It's going to burn in hell if you don't get right with God. She said, is that all you can talk about? I said, it's all I want to talk about now. And you run down and tell those club owners to be man enough to come up here and speak for themselves. And I turned around my secretary and I said, you know, I thank God I wasn't backslid when that pretty gal came by. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You meet so many people nowadays, like when a preacher, like a preacher opening up on Bourbon Street. Well, they thought I was Elma Gantry, reincarnated, coming back after a fast buck, a loose woman. They didn't really know. And on Bourbon Street, you meet so many characters. You got some misters and misses and mistakes, you know. And some of the fellas, it's getting so hard nowadays for me to marry folks down in the quarter. I was married a couple the other day, and it was very, very embarrassing for me because I didn't know which was what. And I, they stood there in front of me, and they both with their hair so, you know, back down the back there. And I said to them, I said, well, whichever one you are, take whichever one this is to be whatever y'all going to be. You know? <laughs> it makes it so hard nowadays, but I have more fun. The chaplain of Bourbon Street's a title given to me by the mayor, Victor H. Skiro of New Orleans a few years ago. When I just took upon myself enough strength and enough courage to cast my spiritual lots right down in the middle of hell. Wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish, as you walk on in darkness and fears, turn around. Turn around, love is calling, keeps calling you from a life of wasted years. In my senior year of high school, they had us all go on this very special retreat called a search. And they took us off to this retreat house and they put these big blankets over the windows so we never knew what time it was. And they didn't let us sleep for two whole days. And of course, everyone kept breaking down crying, saying, God is love. God is love. Only we were actually saying, Fred is love. Fred is love. Because they asked us to call God Fred while we were on the retreat because they felt the name God was just too off-putting for so many people. And Fred just felt so much friendlier. <laughs> so we were saying, Fred is love. I am walking on Fred's path. <laughs> I remember after the retreat, all of us seniors were in this bus going back to school down these really scary, steep, winding switchback roads. And another senior, Larry, who a few years later would leave the Catholic Church to become an evangelical Christian, turned to me with this big beatific grin on his face and he said, just think, if this bus got into a big accident right now and we were all killed, we'd all probably just go straight up to heaven. We all nodded like, yeah. Our souls are so clean and pure at this moment. How wonderful would it be if we were all killed in a big bus accident right now? Because we'd all fly straight up to Fred! <laughs> this is how I danced in high school. I didn't really date in high school. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> Here I was, years and years later, saying God is love again myself. But what did I mean exactly? I decided I would think more about this whole idea of God being love. The feeling of love. Did I think there was a God behind it? Or in it? There seemed to be a lot of incentive to feel love just for its own sake. Without God, would there be no love?
of these folk that want us to be quiet at church. I have problems like everybody else, but I am saved. I may not feel real good, but I am saved. Hallelujah. I'm a black man in America. That's enough to dance about right now. I was on my way to hell, but Jesus stepped in. I am saved. Oh, oh. that's something to shout about to dance a little bit. Thank you, Jesus, for another one coming home. You see, he should have gone in because there's power in praise. When you bless your name, there is power because there's power. I wish I had some help up in here. Anybody know it ain't 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 no danger in God. It ain't no danger. For my confusion, I found someone who had thought about this topic a lot, someone who made it clear. Now at this point, I knew a little bit of science, but not a lot, and that made me the perfect candidate for Deepak Chopra. <laughs> I read The Way of the Wizard, Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, The Quantum Alternative to Growing Old, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, and How to Know God. I basked my way through Deepak's books. I thought I'd get it. God is energy and intention in the quantum field or something. Deepak says that by perceiving changelessness, Time ceases to exist. I love Deepak. I did an interview on The View on ABC, and Deepak also happened to be a guest on the exact same show, and I gushed all over him in the green room telling him how wonderful he was. I did notice that he looked a little older than he looked on his book jacket, and I wondered if his perceived timelessness was working on his own body. <laughs> I told him how his books were helping me understand what and who God was, what ultimate reality was, and also I just had to tell him that I appreciated that he also had advice about how to create spontaneous wealth and how to lose weight. <laughs> Deepak says the world is the creation of the observer and the body is information and energy spanning the universe. Consciousness is the ground of all being. It created us and we are part of it. Deepak believes that we can tap into this big consciousness with our awareness and that it is the source of all creativity and intention and synchronicity. And if you want proof, well, the exotic field of quantum mechanics proves all of it. I was really enthralled with how Deepak was using science, the cutting edge science of quantum mechanics. This was so much better than using myths and superstitions to find spirituality. This was using science and physics to find spirituality. I was so intrigued by this quantum mechanics that Deepak refers to over and over and over again in his books that I decided to take a class in it.
Edward Current here. I'd like to declare a ceasefire in my war on atheism for a few minutes to talk to our teenage Christian boys. My peeps, you all, about something very important. Now, as you may have noticed, some parts of your body are growing faster than others. And certain activities of the flesh, whether it's watching the MTV or climbing a rope in gym class or even wrestling with your buddies at a sleepover, may lead a young man to temptation. What I'm trying to say is it's a sin to spill your seed. And I don't have to tell you what that means, but in case you aren't sure, this kind of seed comes out of your, you know, your Jonah. Your Hosea, okay? And leaves a stain on your sheets. Except, that's not all it does. When you blow Gideon's trumpet, you're killing millions and millions of tiny microscopic angels. A wicked sin. And for what? Your own filthy pleasure? Now, I was a young boy once, and believe me, I spent many long hours alone in my bedroom fighting, beating, the demon. So I know what it's like. And I realize young people need some tools to fight this animalistic urge. Not that people are animals. We are blessed vessels created in God's image. It's just that the Heavenly Father also gave us sex organs to use against our legal spouses when we're being fruitful and multiplying in the dark. And oh, It's a long story. The important thing is, when you go to bed at night, that's when the devil comes out to play. And it's when you, as a healthy young teenager, bursting with new feelings and smells and muscles, are, are at your weakest. Now, one thing I found really effective, the Bible. If you're right-handed, just hold the Bible in your right hand. And if you're left-handed... Well, you should probably ask your pastor what can be done about that. I've heard there's a special summer camp where you can go and pray it away. But anyway, hold the Bible with your demon hand, or God help you both hands if necessary. And if the devil really gets up in your business, squeeze that Bible. Do not let go. Grip it like you're starving and it's a, a foot-long hot dog. That reminds me. To demonstrate how this works, I have something. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It, it's only a massager I found in Mrs. Current's nightstand. I'm sure she won't mind. Now, as you can see, if you wrap your fingers around it with a firm grip and gently stroke it, the Bible, nothing can go wrong. You see. Now, th that's fine for going to sleep. But what do you do if you wake up in the middle of the night... And this has happened, huh? That's when you need to bring in the heavy artillery. Close your eyes and think about someone watching you, your dead grandmother in heaven, or a guidance counselor, or maybe even a, a respected older man from your church, so disappointed, watching as you strangle the serpent. But, but don't stop there. If need be, cry out for the Lord to deliver you. Tell God that you are coming to him, not the devil. But, and this is important, you must pray your body to retain that pearly, milky issue for the one thing on God's earth that it was created for, the unholy chalice of your future wife. Now, believe me, these techniques will go a long way toward everlasting purity. But if you're a Christian youth and you're still struggling with this demon, I can help. I'll be happy to give you my personal, private cell phone number. That way, late at night, when you're... I mean, any time you want, we can talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and you not handling that organ of yours quite so much. Well, that's all the time we have. Good night and... Stay strong. And what I found is that Deepak Chopra is full of shit. <laughs> I 
I wanted to go back in time, and instead of gushing at Chopra, I wanted to say, Deepak, what the hell are you doing? There is no universal consciousness that can be demonstrated with quantum mechanics. There is no healing of the body or arresting of the aging process through telepathy. I mean, sure, subatomic waves and particles do behave in perplexing and very strange ways to us, especially when we try to measure them, apparently. But that doesn't mean that there are angels or that the universe wants me to make more money. I mean, I know this, and I just took one measly class. I turned on the TV one day to find Deepak back on his beloved show, The View, promoting his new book, Golfing to Enlightenment. And all the ladies were so thrilled. Who knew you could achieve enlightenment on the links? <laughs> I started feeling so angry at the New Age movement. So arrogant, so clueless. I mean, here was the generation that was supposed to be the best educated, the ones who threw off the shackles of superstition and traditional religion, and then what did they do? They just gravitated towards chakras and auras and crystals and quantum consciousness. I mean, what is the matter with people? And then I thought, oh. Dear, what is happening to me? I'm becoming so cantankerous. I'm going to become one of those angry retired people who just keeps writing letters to the editor. <laughs> <laughs> And I realized that the class I took didn't just give me a very rudimentary understanding of the very basics of quantum mechanics. I actually learned something much more deeply disturbing about myself. Which was that I'd never really been taught critical thinking skills before.
evaluate evidence. I always thought that being smart meant that you knew a lot of things or that you did what the teacher told you to do really, really well, not that you had this mechanism for filtering information. Plus, the truth was, I was starting to feel nervous about my relationship with God. I felt like we were this married couple in trouble, just trying to find some common ground. I began to wonder just who I was married to. How defined did it really need to be for me? I mean, the truth was God worked for me. William James said, it doesn't work because it's true, it's true because it works. When I prayed, I felt calmer, more focused. It really changed my state of mind. But just because the idea of God worked so well for me, it didn't necessarily mean that he existed. I felt suspicious. For the first time, I wondered if God wasn't just my imaginary friend. As they say, the invisible and the non-existent often look very much alike. But then I thought... But, 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 well, wait a minute, God requires faith, and faith does not require evidence, right? But then the more I thought about it, the more I had to admit that my faith really was based on evidence. The evidence of how I felt when I prayed. The evidence of everyone believing in God, almost everyone I ever met from the time I was a kid. The evidence of what I had been taught by people that I trusted and admired. And people who ultimately had authority over me. So my faith in God really was based on evidence. Well then, how could I not examine that evidence? But then, how did I examine anything? How did I know what I knew? I had to know.
was thinking about these things while I was wandering around Auntie's bookstore in Spokane, Washington, and I glanced up and I saw this book called How the Mind Works by this guy, Steven Pinker. And I thought, wow, how does the mind work anyway? <laughs> Turns out, dendrites and neurons and glial cells and spindle cells. I mean, apparently the nature of consciousness is still mysterious in some respects, but basically we're talking about neurons firing through dendrites, often releasing chemicals in our bodies. Reading how the mind works released this appetite inside me that I never knew existed. I couldn't stop reading. I had to find out how we understand what we understand, what we really know. And I found that all of our brains are on drugs all of the time. We give ourselves hits, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin. The next time all of you laugh in here, I'll get a little shot of adrenaline through my veins. And if you don't, when I expect you to, I'll get cortisol instead and feel anxious. Thanks. <laughs> I always thought that I was a person in my family who had escaped addictions, but I realized I am up here on this stage right now partly because I am an addict. Also, I learned that memory, memory is very, very unreliable, even when we think we remember for sure. It turns out our memories are not automatic video playbacks, but instead reconstructions. Our memories get filtered by our prior prejudices and then mixed up with things that happen later. And that was a very scary thought for me because my memories well, that makes me who I am. When I think of myself as my innermost being, I just don't think of it as a body function. My brain creates this idea that myself is not itself. I mean, I think of myself as something separate, looking out from my eyes, listening through my ears, pulling the strings that make my body move. Thank you. 
because the brain is not able to perceive its own functioning. And this is true for all of us, by the way, right from childhood. When a child is told that it's their brain that thinks, you know, they don't think their brain is them. They think their brain is this thinking computing machine, something that is added to their self to help them understand things. And yet the mind is what the brain does, just like pumping blood is what the heart does. Reading about the brain opened this door in my interest that I never knew existed. I was catapulted into this binge of reading. I was voracious. It was like I had really been starved my entire life for science, like the Cambrian explosion happened in my own brain. And I liked it. It was challenging. And unlike every other knowledge quest, this one actually got better the closer you looked. For the first time, knowing too much didn't ruin it. I always thought that science was this set of immutable facts revealed by nature. And then when I would read, you know, as a layperson about how, say, a planet was now not a planet anymore, or gravity wasn't like we thought, I always thought that it was a failing of science, another sign at how totally unsure science was. But I realized these examples were not signs of weakness. They were signs of strength, that the method was working, constantly filtering new and even better information. I had it all backwards when I was younger. It's the scientists who are good at dealing with uncertainty. I was dating a guy at this time who was a big believer in intelligent design. Intelligent design is this idea that the world is so complex, especially the conscious, feeling, thinking human being who is so complicated that it just couldn't have happened by chance. Someone or something had to have a hand in creating us. And that someone or something is God. The watch requires a watchmaker. My intelligent designer boyfriend and I were waking up, and he glanced at the books on my side of the bed, which were becoming increasingly more biological rather than religious. And then we gazed into each other's eyes, deeper than ever before. <sighs> it's the human eye, you know, he said. That's the proof there must have been a designer. You can't have half an eye. Half an eye is no good at all. Either you have an eye so you can see, or you don't. How could you possibly evolve an eye? 
Yes, I said. That's probably true. The eye. The eye is very complex. After all, it's the window into the soul. <laughs> so I began to read about eyes. I learned a lot more than I ever dreamed about eyes. Turns out, from an evolutionary perspective, the human eye is perfectly explainable. What began as a patch of skin, more sensitive to light than other skin, offers some advantage. Those that have it live; those that don't, do not. Turns out, half an eye actually is pretty valuable. About half as valuable. <laughs> Now, if an intelligent designer or God designed our eyes, well, he would not actually get such a very good grade because he put the blood blood vessels and nerves that carry all the visual information to our brain. On top of our retina, imagine that's like putting all the wiring of a video camera on top of the lens. And where the blood vessels and nerves go through our retina into our brain, it causes us all to have this blind spot that we compensate for by basically hallucinating, which is bad, 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 bad. Not a good design for an eye. And it doesn't really have to be that way. Octopus and squid, they evolve their eyes separately from us, and they don't have those annoying features. The wonderful biologist Massimo Piliucci, he wrote, "The only possible conclusions that we can come to from this evidence are that God didn't design the eye, or he did, and he's pretty sloppy and not worthy of our unconditional admiration, or God likes squids a lot better than humans." Well, we got a new dance, and it goes like this. Rope a doggy, rope, rope a doggy. The name of this dance is a rodeo twist. Rope a doggy, rope, rope a doggy. Shake it like this, shake it like this. Down the rodeo twist, rodeo twist. You get a long handle rope, stack it on his head, ride an old bronc, pick, make him dance. Find a little doggy that's never been kissed, put a hot iron on him, and you watch him twist. Well, we got a new dance, and it goes like this. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. The name of this dance is a rodeo twist. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. Shake it like this, shake it like this. Down the rodeo twist, rodeo twist. Well, you cinch up your rigging and you strap on your spurs. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. Careful where you stop, you get 'em tangled up with hers. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. Shake it like this, shake it like this. Down the rodeo twist, the rodeo twist. You start a crazy little wiggle with the toe of your boot. Be sure to set tight when they open the chute. Take a handful of rope, wrap it up in your fist, and watch the old brain of bull do the rodeo twist. We got a new dance and it go like this. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. The name of this dance is a rodeo twist. Rope a doggy, rope a rope a doggy. Shake it like this, shake it like this. Down the rodeo twist, the rodeo twist. Oh, shake it like this, the rodeo twist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Intelligent design gets everything backwards. It's like saying that our hands are miraculous because they fit so perfectly into our gloves. <laughs> That four fingers and a thumb. Now that can't have been an accident. My old cat Rita lumbered onto my lap while I was reading about eyes. She was about 15 years old then and had gotten too tired and bothered to go through the entire meow. She just started going meow. We looked each other in the eye. Instead of noticing the differences, I actually noticed the similarities. We inherited our eyes from our common ancestor, who probably lived around 100 million years ago. Our eyes are forward on our skull because we are hunters. So, well, Rita wasn't much of a hunter, and I realized neither was I. Not if I was dating a guy who was so into intelligent design. Rita meowed at me like, "Oh, who needs to hunt when I have domestic help?" <laughs> Then. I started reading about all of these experiments on the function of the temporal lobes. These doctors figured out a way to stimulate electromagnetically the right temporal lobe. People who wore this helmet experienced a transcendent sense of understanding, an overwhelming peace and connectedness, 
and sometimes the presence of God or of aliens. <laughs> this was often accompanied by a white light. Everyone has a certain right temporal lobe sensitivity. We're all susceptible to these types of experiences. So this could have been what was happening to me when I had that whole heal me, heal me experience. Of course, this doesn't mean that God doesn't just use this physical way to allow us to experience him. Or her. Or whoever. But that sure was interesting. Julia Sweeney was reminded of the great memories she had of church and ritual, and she wishes her daughter could have had what she had, and maybe she could start going again and go back to Spokane. It triggered something in me, something any Scientologist might call a re-stim or an engram or something, but that's for a later conversation. I went to my dark place when I remember the church I grew up in. I had a little breakdown, but I couldn't put my finger on anything precisely. I tried to think about what it was that Julia had that I didn't. Was it the loving community or the theater of it all? 
I think about that community, and I remember nothing but solicitous liars, schisms, and fellow victims. A little voice inside me tells it maybe I should just go burn down the church, which is just a little closer than a mile from here. Luckily, I'm not religious, and I don't obey little voices in my head. Without getting into my dark place and why my throat closes up and I feel violent when I have memories of that damn church I spent six days a week in, my point to Julie is that you can't always go home. Her daughter is not guaranteed the same experience she had. I'm sure she knows that. For one thing, she used to fervently believe the thing that made her have a religious experience that overwhelming loving presence could not happen to her now, so her own experience of church can't be the same. And then there's the community. Maybe her Spokane community is great and loving and wonderful, but would you, if you were part of a community, totally embrace someone who wants to be a part while they deny its very essence? I know that the community I was a part of shunned us when we rejected just a tiny part of its beliefs. My parents joined the church when they moved to town to give us a community and to give us a moral sense, I guess. But what I got out of it was a whole lot different than what they expected. How could a parent even know? You, as an adult, you might enjoy the trappings and be able to disassociate the messages you don't like. But how is a kid supposed to do that? How is a kid to be expected to have that organized a mind to be able to do that? How schizophrenic is that when you get completely conflicting messages from people who are presented as authorities, and huge authorities no less, the almighty parents who have complete control over your existence, and then there's these figures who, in fancy costumes, surrounded by angels and gods, standing above a large group of people at an altar telling you they represent the ultimate control. Is choir singing and hand waving and incense and convenient babysitting from psychos really fucking worth it?